Hello and welcome to uh, lectures for week 8 and in today's lecture we are going to see how the French Revolution is in the ascendancy and uh, its ideological significance which is that uh, the cruelty of the French Revolution even though it begins with a legitimate progression kind of um, begins to mirror the cruelty of the aristocracy. So, we are shown a, a picture of the revolutionary France which is as harsh and as cruel as the aristocracy which was reigning the previous regime in France. This chapter is entitled chapter 22 and is uh, titled the sea, the sea still rises. So, if you remember the previous uh, chapter it was titled the sea rises and in this chapter there is a continuation of the French revolutionary movement and this chapter begins with uh, Madame Dufarge taking a look at the scene that is unfolding in front of her and uh, let us see what exactly is the scene. Madame Defarge with her arms folded sat in the morning light and heat contemplating the wine shop and the street. In both there were several knots of loungers squalid and miserable but now with a manifest sense of power enthroned on their distress. The raggedest nightcap awry on the wretchedest head had this crooked significance in it. I know how hard it has grown for me the wearer of this to support life in myself but do you know how easy it has grown for me the wearer of this to destroy life in you. So, this is a fantastic paragraph uh, to give the readers a sense that nothing much has changed in France in terms of the economic status of the people, but what exactly has changed is the sense of power that has become invested in these poor people. So, let us look at some of the words that indicate that. Uh, so, there is a look at this phrase there is a manifest sense of power enthroned. So, they are kingly almost in their power even though their situation is uh, distressful. The economic poverty has not changed a wee bit, but they are uh, invested with a lot of power to injure the other person. So, this is what the narrator says uh, the raggedest nightcap, the poorest man on the street has, has grown very powerful powerful and he seems to say that uh, um, I am not able to support life adequately in me, but I am capable of destroying life in you. So, um, the poor have uh, kind of uh, wrested the power to attack and maim just as the aristocrats when they were in power were uh, attacking and maiming the people who were beneath them. The only difference here is that the aristocrats were extremely wealthy whereas that is not the case with these uh, uh, revolutionary mob. Now, we are given a specific instance uh, with regard to a particular character from the old regime who is now uh, being punished uh, uh, by the uh, revolutionary mob and this particular figure is called old Foulon. He was the counsellor of state to King Louis the 16th and Dickens draws uh, uh, his source for this particular narrative about old Foulon from Carlyle's French revolution revolution written in the 1830s. So, this is the exchange that becomes uh, very popular in history as well as in cultural uh, uh, you know milieu with regard to uh, the revolutionary France. What will the people do and he is uh, supposed to have replied the people may eat grass. So, it is a cruel uh, unsympathetic uh, harsh uh, remark of old Foulon when uh, he was asked for advice about the status of the people. So, uh, now the time has come for him to pay for the uh, crimes and his uh, hard heartedness towards the people. Let us see how it comes about. Defarge is the one who is uh, 
speaking these lines and he has come to his neighborhood Saint Antoine in Paris and he is telling his uh, supporters that old Fulon who pretended um, to be dead uh, in fact old Fulon uh, gives out the news that he is dead and then there's a mock funeral for old Fulon and that uh, kind of lulls the people into believing that he is no more but then um, Defarge finds out that that is not the truth and old Fulon is still alive and he has been uh, taken by the uh, Jacques and this is what he says he feared us so much and with reason that he caused himself to be represented as dead and had a grand mock funeral but they have found him alive hiding in the country and have brought him in I have seen him but now on his way to the Hotel de Ville a prisoner I have said that he had reason to fear us say all had he reason so this narrative in brief gives us the context for old Fulon and as I said he had represented as uh, being dead to the public and then there was a grand uh, mock funeral uh, for his death and uh, but now he has been imprisoned and he is taken to Hotel the Will the place he is going to be tried for his crimes. And um, Defat says that um, old Fulon does have a reason to fear us and he kind of offers this question to uh, the crowd and he kind of whips the crowd into a fury. So uh, and um, the mob agrees that yes he had a reason to uh, fear the crowd and this idea of mock funeral is very interesting because um, we did see a funeral in England for Roger Cly and once you read the novel that you will come to understand that that was indeed a mock funeral too. So the idea of pretense is a significant theme that is running through the entire strata of society and across the two nations be it England or, or France the same modes are adopted by the people to escape uh, uh, repression escape being found out and escape being uh, revealed for what they are so pretends and uh, mysterious origins are uh, pretense and mysterious origins are associated with this theme that we have uh, uh, being developed in the context of old Fulon. Okay, so uh, Defarge is also being very theatrical here and he knows how to whip up the crowd which is already very resentful of the aristocracy. Now uh, the crowd is ready and it is listening to Defarge and he asks are we ready are we ready to go in pursuit of old Fulon who is going to be tried in Hotel the Well and the people are very ready and instantly Madame Defarge's knife was in her girdle the drum was beating in the streets as if it and a uh, drummer had flown together by magic and the vengeance uttering terrific shrieks and flinging her arms about her head like all the 40 furies at once was tearing from house to house rousing the women so Defarge is rousing the men into following him and take up new action and his wife um, his counterpart Madame Defarge uh, instantly picks up a knife and uh, kind of uh, keeps it in her girdle and then her companion the vengeance uh, comes to the streets uttering terrific shrieks she's hysterical she is also flinging her arms about uh, like the furies the classic uh, uh, furies and um, she is also uh, provoking the women uh, into joining uh, the crowd she is encouraging them to join the join the crowd and the crowd is heading towards hotel the will so um, this crowd scene also resembles the crowd scene the I would call this the Parisian crowd scene is resembling the crowd scene In, his, in relation to 
the funeral of Roger Cly So there is a kind of a, a hysteria that is running through both the crowd scenes and the crowd is uh, uh, violent in both cases. So the violence of the crowd is something that Dickens uh, feared. So this is how they behave uh, when they are whipped up into a blind frenzy and uh, the people hate old Fulon. They have a lot of resentment against him and um, they remember that old Fulon asked the starving people uh, to eat grass. Fulon who told my old father that he might eat grass when I had no bread to give him. Fulon who told my baby to suck grass when these breasts were dry with want. So. Um, Fulon's comment comes in the context of extreme poverty, uh, extreme dearth, uh, and there's uh, so much want in the countryside that his comment is um, very, very unsympathetic and callous uh, in, in such a context. And therefore, the people do not forget uh, his comments now when they have the power to retaliate. So what do they say? They say, give us the blood of Fulon, give us the head of Fulon, give us the heart of Fulon, give us the body and soul of Fulon rend full on to pieces and dig him into the crown, ground that grass may grow from him. So even before uh, Fulon is given a trial, uh, even before he's judged, the people do judge him and find him guilty and they want um, uh, him to be punished in the most uh, uh, cruelest fashion and uh, this is what they want. They want the blood, they want the head, they want the heart, they want the body and soul and they want to bury him on the ground, in the ground that grass may grow from him. So it is very ironic that he asked the people to eat grass because uh, that's what he will turn into when the power uh, has come to the people. So this is the place, Hotel de Will is the place where um, Fulon is going to be examined and look at the state of that place. It's, it's flooded with um, these numerous uh, uh, people who are kind of clogging the place and the streets leading out of it. So uh, there is a mass of people waiting to see him uh, tried and killed. So this is what the narrator says. Armed men and women flocked out of the quarter so fast they were all by that time choking the hall of examination where this old man, ugly and wicked, was and overflowing into the edges in open spaces and street, streets. The defages, husband and wife, the vengeance and Jacques three were in the first press and at no great distance from him in the hall. So as I said, the entire uh, place um, becomes a sea of people. Um, look at the word used by the narrator, choking, choking the hall of examination. Uh, the people are kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know uh, strangling the air out of that place. They're choking the place. And um, this is the place where this old man who's ugly and wicked, and just because he's old, we can't forget his wickedness. That's what uh, the narrator is implying here. So this old man, this ugly and wicked man is being uh, judged in this um, place and in the first row to witness his uh, trial is the defages and uh, the vengeance and Jacques III. So these are the uh, key set of people who will come to form a clique by themselves, um, by themselves and uh, they will be associated closely with the Republic and the other trials that are going to uh, be staged for the benefit of the uh, revolutionary uh, state. How does Madame Defarge behave uh, at the trial scene of old Foulon? Madame put her knife under her arm and clapped her hands as at a play. So uh, she behaves as if she is watching some kind of theatrical performance. And I'm interested in the idea of theatre here because early on we saw that Defarge was addressing the crowd and whipping it into a blind fury. And he is behaving as a, a character in a stage play. And Madame Defarge here now acts as an audience for a play that's being enacted. So the idea of theatre is key in terms of uh, 
the ideological discourses running through the play. So the change of regime itself becomes a kind of a, a bloody spectacle, literally, for everybody to witness and enjoy. And that does happen in the context of the peasantry who are so deprived that the only enjoyment that they get is through this uh, kind of blood and gore that uh, you know kind of uh, litters the stage of the revolution. And further, in terms of the trial of old Fulon, uh, Madame Defarge kind of comes to occupy the center stage. It's as if she is the one who is the center of attention instead of old Fulon, because everybody is looking at the facial expressions, the body language of this particular woman, and her expressions are uh, watched and communicated by the others to others to others who are outside of the hall of examination, and her um, you know reactions are. are seen as the cue with which the other people follow and uh, imitate her actions. So this is what um, the narrator says about Defarge, Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge's frequent expressions of impatience were taken up with marvelous quickness at a distance, the more readily because certain men who had by, one, by some wonderful agility climbed up the external architecture to look in from the windows, knew Madame Defarge well and acted as a telegraph between her and the crowd outside the building. So uh, look at the way that um, the people become the telegraph and the source of information becomes Madame Defarge and what she communicates is impatience and her impatience is transferred to the people who also become impatient at the way in which the trial is slowly proceeding. So uh, again, uh, the key figure here is Madame Defarge and she will continue to rise in importance until she will uh, kind of sideline her husband himself. Now this is what happens after the trial is over at Hotel de Well, look at old Foulon being dragged outside by the public, the French public. He is dragged, struck out, stifled by bunches of grass. Look at the uh, man who is stuffing grass into his face and um, not only him, several people, hundreds of hands uh, tried to do that. This is an illustration by Fred Barnard for the, uh, in the 1870s. There's a lot of bloodthirst in the faces of the people. Um, everybody is kind of looking at this figure whom they enjoy torturing. A handful of grass here too, a handful of grass here too. The End of Foulon uh, is an illustration by Harry, Harry Furness for the 1910 edition of A Tale of Two Cities. Again, um, there are uh, several hands holding bunches of uh, grass and uh, Foulon is tied up and dragged and pulled uh, in, in several directions by the angry mob and uh, we have a hysterically happy woman here. This is most likely to be uh, the vengeance or it could even be, uh, and here is Madame Defarge who also has her hands on uh, old Foulon. So finally, uh, they hang him. What they do is uh, they string him up. Once he went aloft and the rope broke and they caught him shrieking. Twice he went aloft and the rope broke and they caught him shrieking. Then the rope was merciful and held him and his head was soon upon a pike with grass enough uh, in the mouth for all St. Antoine to dance at the sight of. So um, when they stringing up, string him up, uh, the rope breaks. So he falls again, the people catch him shrieking. So look at the hysteria that's there. And then again they string him up and the uh, rope breaks and they catch him again shrieking and the third time the rope was merciful. So the instrument of execution is termed as merciful whereas the people lack that quality of pity. Uh, they lack pity and they 
cut his head off and um, stuff his head on a pike on a large uh, tall stick and uh, his head um, has a lot of uh, uh, grass uh, in its mouth and the narrator says that Saint Antoine should be pleased at the sight and in fact uh, they dance to the side. So it is a very, very uh, macabre, gory, uh, cruel scene of execution. So what is the implication here? So uh, the implication is that um, the aristocrats by their cruelty did lead the country to such a revolution, but once that revolution did erupt, um, the peasantry, the uh, common public behaved in atrocious manner and they uh, were no different in terms of the cruelty uh, that their predecessors had exhibited. So they come to once again mirror each other and Dickens while he understands why such a revolution happened, if he is not quite happy with the way it kind of unfolded folded. Look at this scene. Uh, this is for Harper's Weekly and uh, the illustration again shows um, the head of uh, Fulon um, in a pike. So what is the world of Saint Antoine like? There is not much change as I said in terms of the quality of life of the people. Uh, this narrative here on the slide tells us about the kind of food that they ate and uh, what they did, um, what the people did after they came back from such scenes of gory murder. Scanty and insufficient suppers those and innocent of meat as most other sauce to wretched bread. Yet human fellowship infused some nourishment into the flinty viands and struck some sparks of cheerfulness out of them. Fathers and mothers who had their full share in the worst of the day played gently with their meagre children and lovers with such a world around them and before them loved and hoped. So they did not have big dinners or suppers once the uh, revolution has happened. They had insufficient and scanty, very less food and they, they did not eat meat uh, and their bread were wretched and they had uh, no great sauce to go, uh, eat the bread with. But despite this lack of uh, uh, proper meals, what they did have was human fellowship and that gave nourishment to the food that they ate together and um, that human fellowship also gave them uh, some some sparks of, of cheerfulness, some sparks, not, not you know, uh, cheerfulness all around, but there was an element of that. And fathers and mo mothers, after, the ca after they came back from such cruel acts, such as the um, killing of old Fulon, played gently with their meager children, you know, puny children, uh, starving children, and even lovers, after coming back from such gory acts, um, kind of found time to, uh, you know, um, enjoy themselves So and, and hoped for better things to come to them. So this is the state of affairs in the days of the revolution. Now, chapter 23 uh, is about uh, the fires that were burning across the nation and where did these fires erupt and uh, the beginning of the chapter once again tells us that uh, the countryside was um, not being nourished, the countryside still starved, there was nothing to live on, the people were miserable, the people were unhappy and everything was worn out, exhausted. Exhaustion is the word that underlies much of the ideas that is um, communicated in this particular uh, excerpt. Far and wide lay a ruined country, yielding nothing but desolation. Every green leaf, every blade of grass and blade of grain was as shriveled and poor as the miserable people. Everything was bowed down, dejected, oppressed and broken. Habitations, fences, domesticated animals, men, women, children and the soil that bore them all worn out. So what is the message that Dickens wants to convey? The revolution brings no change at all. Look at the uh, uh, kind of words that he uses, desolation, shriveled, 
the people are shriveled, their arms are shriveled, their hands are shriveled, the trees are shriveled, and, um, and there is poverty, misery, and everything is depressed and oppressed. Um, so again, as I said, nothing much has changed for the people, no change for the better, and everybody is worn out. This illustration shows us uh, the mender of the roads as well as a strange figure. This is the mender of the roads and this is a man whom we have met before. He was the one who offered testimony to the rough tribunal about old Gaspar. So that's the contest for the mender of the roads and this is a Jacques, a member of the revolutionary group and he has come to this particular village with a specific purpose and that purpose um, is somehow foreshadowed in his uh, pipe which is uh, smoking there very obviously. So we can kind of sense a foreshadowing in this activity of his. Now the fire rises and let us see what exactly um, is happening to the key country house in this particular village. When the village had taken its poor supper it did not creep to bed as it usually did but came out of doors again and remained there. A curious contagion of whispering was upon it and also when it gathered together the fountain in the dark another curious contagion of looking expectantly at the sky in one direction only. Monsieur Gebel, chief functionary of the place, became uneasy, went out on his house top alone and looked in the direction too, glanced down from behind his chimneys at the darkening faces by the fountain below and sent word to the sacristan who kept the keys of the church that there might be need to ring the toxin by and by. So this village is an important space in this novel because this is the place where the child dies. And Marquis Evermonde is the reason behind the death of that child, untimely death. And this is the place where Gaspard is also hung by the state. Uh, and um, that hanging is somehow a warning to the people not to commit such uh, gory murders against people who are important and uh, close to the state. Now, this village, uh, if you look at that excerpt there, that uh, entire village is, is treated as one single uh, man who has had its, um, uh, his poor supper and he does not creep to bed as he usually does. So the village is like a man that stays awake and it is looking at a particular place. And look at the way um, the narrator describes the rumor that is uh, spreading among the people. He calls it the contagion as if it is a nasty disease that is spreading. So the rumor is termed as or the whispering is termed as a contagion. And everybody is looking expectantly at one particular direction. And Monsieur Gebel, Gebel is the one uh, who is the tax collector for the uh, noble lord of that particular village. So he is also looking in the same direction, and uh, he realizes that uh, he has to do something, and he sends word to the man who keeps the keys of the church that there might be need to ring, there might be a need to ring the alarm bells soon. So something dangerous is going to happen. What is that? The chateau or the palace, the big country estate of Marquis Evermonde, who is no more, um, is going to be burnt and it does burn, the fire rises and uh, we realize that the man who was talking to the mender of the roads who was trying to get directions from the mender of the roads as to how to reach the particular village and that chateau is the one who is behind the fire that he sets to the chateau. Presently the chateau began to make itself strangely visible by some light of its own as though it were growing luminous. Then a flickering plate behind the architecture of the front, picking out transparent places and showing where balustrades, arches and windows were. Then it soared higher and grew broader and brighter. Soon 
from a score of the great windows, flames burst forth and the stone faces awakened, stared out of fire. So clearly, uh, very uh, slowly the fire builds inside this uh, big chateau, big palace and um, look at the way it is mildly de described so, uh, uh, at points we don't know what exactly is happening and then we realize yes there is a big fire that's burning within the chateau and soon it becomes very uh, transparent everybody is able to notice and the fire soars higher it's growing higher and higher and um, flames are bursting forth from the windows and the stone faces the sculptures that were decorating the chateau the palace like um, architecture um, seems seem to stare out of the fire it's as if the uh, faces of the sculptures are staring glaring and they are burning as well so um, it's it's a, a literal and a symbolic act of destruction destruction of the aristocracy thank you for watching i'll continue in the next session